Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. It was 3.30 on Friday afternoon, and I was counting down the hours. At 48 I was heading for what may be the most exciting day of my life. I was getting married to someone I considered the most beautiful girl in the world. Jane was being an old-fashioned girl, telling me that it was unlucky for me to see the bride on the night before the wedding. So she'd gone to stay the night with an old college friend. I was just going up to my home office to check that I had all the arrangements done when I heard her key in the door. Okay, scatterbrain, what have you forgotten? I called out as I came back down the stairs. At the bottom of the stairs, I turned towards the front door and froze. She stood there, with her Mediterranean tan, wearing a two-piece suit that probably cost as much as I took out of the company in a week. She looked at me, gave me a big smile and ran the best she could in her tight skirt and high heels, with her arms outstretched. Kevin, I'm back? She tried to kiss me but I turned my head so that her lips landed only on my cheek. Grabbing her arms, I pushed her off me. What the hell are you doing here? Kevin, that's no way to talk to your wife. This is my home. I've come back home. Firstly, you're not my wife, and secondly, this is not your home. This is my house, and you have no right to be in it. I turned and walked towards the lounge. Well, I thought you might be angry, but I think you're taking this a bit far. I opened a drawer and took out a small card. Picking up the phone I dialed the number on the card. This is Kevin Bryant. Yes, the same. She's back. Yes, my ex-wife, Lisa. Yes, she's right in front of me. Well, you'd better be quick because I'll be sending her on her way pretty soon. I switched the phone off. Who was that? She asked. Detective Inspector Maynard of the local police. The police, but I've done nothing wrong. Maybe not, but they think I have. My next call was to my son, Elliot, and the conversation went much the same way. Why don't you take a seat, Lisa? It seems that some people would like to talk to you. You're welcome to wait here for them. It had been six years since I had seen Lisa, though it seemed like more. So much had happened in that time. I could still remember the day I came home to find an envelope containing her bank cards, credit card, and a short note. Kevin, I'm leaving to find my true destiny. Please don't waste your time and money trying to find me. You won't succeed, and even if you did you wouldn't change my mind. I hope life treats you kindly and that you find it in yourself to forgive me. Good luck. Yours truly, Lisa. The note was printed from my office computer. She couldn't even handwrite it. We had been school day sweethearts, getting together when I was 18 and Lisa just 16. Back in those days, I was considered a high flyer. I used to joke with Lisa that I'd be a millionaire by the time I was 30. At least, it was a joke to me. I got into Manchester University and studied electronics. Of course, I met plenty of girls at university, but there was only one girl for me. Lisa was the girl that all the boys wanted to date, but she'd just tell them she was waiting for her millionaire. Every holiday I'd be back and we'd be together. Of course, I had to work during the holidays, but we still saw plenty of each other. The surprise came when just after my finals Lisa told me she was pregnant. I say it was a surprise because I thought we'd been careful. However, accidents happen. I always thought we'd get married someday, so why not now? I graduated with first-class honors and had offers from a number of the electronics and telecom giants. That was probably our first disagreement. Lisa wanted me to take a job with one of the big boys. After all, they paid well, and there was a lot of prestige in working for them. I, on the other hand, wanted to work for a small organization where I felt I could achieve more. I did it my way, and we moved to Somerset. Danvers Electronics was a small company that designed and built navigation aids for yachtsmen and did little work for the defense industry. The company was owned by Bob Danvers, a man in his 40s. Two things really attracted me to the company. First was Bob himself. He was an engineer and realized that investment at the sharp end of the company was the most important. His designers worked with top-of-the-range equipment, while the administrators and managers frequently made do with computers the designers had outgrown. The second was the fact that their chief designer was nearing retirement age. I was likely to climb the ladder a lot quicker there than at one of the big companies. Bob was a genuinely good bloke. Once I'd accepted the job he found a flat for Lisa, bumped in me, and paid our deposit and the first three months' rent. My first few months' salary went on buying second-hand furniture, preparing for the arrival of Elliot. Lisa really blossomed while pregnant, and that bloom didn't leave her after Elliot was born. Within four months she got her figure back, in fact it was better than before. At five foot eight she was taller than most women, and her chestnut hair with blue eyes made her stand out from the crowd. If the boys at school were jealous before, they'd be doubly so now. We soon outgrew the flat and were looking for a house. Once again, Bob helped us. He convinced me that renting was giving money away and that I should try to buy a house. I only had enough saved for half the deposit, 
So Bob loaned us the other half. It wasn't all philanthropy with Bob. He knew I could get a better deal elsewhere, and he knew that if I bought a house I was more likely to stay in the area. As the years went by, things got a little easier. I really wanted more children, but we just weren't lucky that way. When the chief designer retired, Bob confounded my plans by deciding on a restructure. He wanted design and development brought together under one leader. My heart sank when he came to me and asked me to come and meet the design and development manager. He took me up to his office. When we got there, the place was empty. He opened another door. Oh, he must be in here, he said and pushed me through the door into his in-suite toilet. As I walked in I was looking straight in the mirror. Kevin, meet the new design and development manager. I was somewhat taken aback. No application, no interviews, just being told I'd got the job. Well, he said, are you going to take the job? You'd better bloody take it. I've based this whole restructuring around you. Are you sure, Bob? I mean, I was hoping for the design job, but are you sure you want me to run the combined department? I was sure after your first month of working for me. You don't really think I didn't know what I was getting. I made my inquiries before I offered you a job. You and Lisa may look upon me as a benevolent old fool, but if you do, you're wrong. I'm a businessman and you, young man, are very good for business. My new position meant a big increase in salary, and I knew Lisa would have no trouble spending it. It seems that we all have our own talents. Mine was for logic, electronics, and finding new and innovative ways of doing things. Lisa's talent was for spending money. I made arrangements with Bob so that not all of my new salary would be paid into our joint account. 10% got diverted to a savings account. Lisa still saw an increase, but it gave me a buffer for rainy days. Over the next few years, the company's defense work increased, largely due to my department's drive to diversify. In the process, I filed a couple of patents, having come up with cheaper, better ways of proving the same result. We weren't a large enough company to take on all the work our patents would guarantee, so we allowed our competitors to use some of our designs under a license, giving us royalties. Since the patents came from my work, Bob insisted I took a percentage of the royalties as an annual bonus, which I used to reduce the outstanding mortgage. I thought we were doing quite well. By the time I was 30 we had our own detached house in the country, two cars, and a good standard of living. When I mentioned this to Lisa once, she reminded me. You always said you'd be a millionaire by now. That was when I realized she hadn't got the joke. If Lisa was disappointed in me, she did a good job covering it up. Our life was good. We were comfortably well off. Our sex life was great. If a little plain, we had a social life. The only real disagreement was about Elliot's education. Lisa wanted him to have a public school. This means a non-state school, private school in the U.S. education. I argued that the state system was good enough for us. Perhaps if you'd gone to public school you would be a millionaire by now, instead of working for some tin pot electronics company. It's that tin pot electronics company that enables us to have this argument. Without it, we wouldn't have sufficient income to even think of it. Ah, uh, so you admit we can afford it. If you loved our son, you'd give him every advantage you could. Lisa won that one and Elliot went to Kingswood. He went as a day pupil, so Lisa had to take him every day. It cost me six grand a year, but it bought me peace and, what the hell, it was six grand that didn't go on shoes and clothes, or so I thought. To be honest, the fees were far from the worst part of it. No, by far the worst part of having a child at public school is having to socialize with the other parents. At least, that was the case with the ones that Lisa chose to strike up friendships with. They seemed to be stockbrokers, bankers, investment analysts, and the like. Not one of them worked in a business that actually made anything. By the time Elliot was in his second year, we were being invited to dinner parties, and I could only stall for a short while. I tried to get on with them. I really did. But most of the time I found myself biting my tongue. I suppose that's when the rot started. Lisa really looked up to these people. I regarded them as parasites who fed off the work of others. I see you've remodeled the garden. Sorry, what was that? I asked. Lisa stood by the patio doors, looking out into the garden. The garden, she said. You've remodeled it. It looks very nice. What brought that about? After a couple of weeks with 30 policemen and two mechanical diggers out there, it was in such a mess that it was simpler to just dig it up and start again. Policemen and diggers, what were they doing here? Looking for you. She was just about to say something else when the doorbell rang. I answered the door and found Detective Inspector Maynard and a woman police constable on my doorstep. Good afternoon, Mr. Bryant. This is WPC Cavendish. Inspector, Miss Cavendish, please come in. You say she's back, sir. Is she still here? She most certainly is. Please follow me and I'll introduce you. I took them through to the lounge where Lisa was still looking out at the garden. Inspector, Miss Cavendish, 
This is my ex-wife, Lisa. Lisa, this is Inspector Maynard and WPC Cavendish. Did you really dig up my garden, Inspector? Yes, madam. We did. Now, if you don't mind, I need to ask you a few questions. Do you have any identification, Mrs. Bryant? Well, I have my passport in my bag if that will do. Maynard said it would. So Lisa retrieved it from her bag and handed it to him. He checked the passport, looked at Lisa, then at the passport photo. He then produced a photograph from his pocket. It was a copy of one I'd given him when he first started the investigation. He passed the passport to the WPC, who made a note of the number, full name, and date of birth, before handing it back to the inspector. He thanked Lisa and returned the passport to her. Now, Mrs. Bryant, would you like to tell us where you've been for the last six years? Do we have to do this now, inspector? In front of my husband and all? Can I come down the station later and give you the whole story? Well, I could take you down the station now, if you like. We have a patrol car outside. As for your husband, I can think of no one more entitled to answers after what he has been through. Lisa looked over at me with pleading eyes. Kevin, I know you're angry with me for leaving you, but this isn't going to make it any better. Lisa, I'm not angry about you leaving. What I am angry about is that you came back and you came back today. I was almost shouting at this point. So I walked over to the window, sat in a chair and looked out at the garden. Just to brighten my mood, it started raining. Mrs. Bryant, where have you been all the time we've been trying to find you? Now, I didn't know you were looking for me. I told Kevin not to do that. He didn't. We did. Now, where have you been? Well, first we went to the south of France, then on to Spain. After that it was Barbados, and then I went back to Spain. Now I've come home. This is not your home, I told her. She was just about to say something when Maynard stopped her. Mr. Bryant, I realize that you're upset, but I must ask you to keep quiet. I need to hear Mrs. Bryant's story so I can decide whether a crime has been committed. If it has, then we'll have to continue the interview at the station. He turned back to Lisa. Now, Mrs. Bryant, you say you've been abroad. Yet we contacted all the local taxi companies and none of them picked you up. We also checked at all the airports and ports. You weren't listed as a passenger on any of them. Just how did you leave the country? She looked over at me again, as if checking to see if I was listening. The fact is I wasn't really bothered about where she'd been or how she got there. The only thing that bothered me was where she was now. A friend picked me up here, and we went to Farnborough where he keeps his plane. He then flew us out to Nice, on the Riviera. So you see, it's hardly surprising no one knew where I'd gone. I had switched off to the conversation and just sat there, looking out at the rain. On reflection, you could trace the troubles in our marriage back to the time when Elliot started at Kingswood. Lisa thought we should be living the lives of the other parents. She wanted us to move to Bath and Holiday in the south of France. I wanted us to pay off our mortgage and save for retirement. Needless to say, there were plenty of arguments, but most of the time we made up before bedtime. However, after one of the dinner parties all that changed. Henry, one of the guests and the father of one of Elliot's friends, had drunk a little too much wine. He was telling us all about his bonuses from the hedge fund he worked for. I could have happily ignored that, but he went on to tell us all about the deal he was aiming to pull off. He'd found a small company near Farnborough which made hand held GPS navigation systems. The company owned quite a lot of land, which the owner had bought years ago to allow an expansion which never took place. Silly old fool doesn't know what he's got, said Henry. The land alone is worth millions as industrial land, ten times more as residential building land. The old duffer wants to retire, but insists on selling the company as a going concern to protect his workforce. So what are you planning then, Henry? I asked. Oh, we'll buy him out at what he thinks is a good price. Then we set up a holding company and transfer all the land, including the factory, to that company. The holding company charges the factory a fair rent for the building. Meanwhile, we sell the rights to the products to one of the big boys, and the factory has to pay license fees to make the product they developed. We sell the factory off cheap but, with rent and license fees to pay, they'll never make a profit. So they default on the rent, and the landlord, that's us, is forced to evict them. Then we sell the whole parcel of land off for housing. We'll make 20 to 30 times what we paid, and all within two years. And what happens to the workforce then, Henry? My dear boy, in every battle there are casualties. Can't be helped. All so that you can get your bonus. You evil, blood-sucking bastard. Henry took a swing at me. I sidestepped and he fell across the table, breaking several plates and plastering cake all over his jacket. Lisa heard the noise and came to see what had happened. Get your coat, Lisa. We're leaving. That was the last dinner party I ever attended. Come to think of it, it was the last one I was ever invited to. Lisa still went to them but said she was on her own. 
I knew that meant the hostess invited other men to partner Lisa. Lisa denied this, but I knew that was the way it worked. When I got into work on Monday I told Bob all about Henry's little plan. We both knew the company he was talking about and tried to work out a plan to help. By the time we'd finished, Bob had taken over the factory and the excess land had been sold off. Bob gave a fair price for the factory and, with the land being sold off for housing, the owner got far more than Henry's hedge fund would ever have given him. It was a little over a month after our plan was complete that I learned of Henry's anger. Lisa came home from one of the parties and almost instantly attacked me. You just had to interfere, didn't you? She yelled at me. Mr. Holier than thou Kevin Bryant just had to interfere. It's not enough that you embarrass me in front of my friends. Now you use information you got from the party to ruin Henry's plan. Ah, is poor little Henry upset? I asked. He's way past upset. He says you've taken the food out of his children's mouths. It was his bonus against the livelihoods of a hundred men. No contest in my book. Why do you have to make it so bloody difficult? I do my best to make new friends, people that can help us move up in society, and all you do is insult them and hinder everything I do. It could have been my father's, or your father's jobs that he was destroying. Have you forgotten where you came from? No, I haven't forgotten. The difference is, I don't want to go back there. So that was it. She really was ashamed of me. I was never going to be a millionaire. Not like Henry. We did sleep on a problem that night. We never spoke of it again, but it was clear things had changed. Our sex life, or at least mine, deteriorated significantly. Lisa handled everything to do with the school, and I was happy to let her. She joined a fundraising committee, which meant that she spent even more time in Bath. I just put everything into work. I spent more time there. I brought work home with me, and when I wasn't working I was out of the house as much as possible. I gave way on the annual holiday that year, and we spent a couple of weeks in Juan Les Pins in July. As luck had it, we picked the right time for the jazz festival. It meant that I took Elliot out most evenings, and Lisa had him during the day. Lisa was preoccupied with spotting the rich and famous, and spent a lot of time parading in her bikini in front of the gin palaces in the harbor. That was the last of our holidays together. I felt I'd given Lisa the holiday she wanted, so the next year should be my choice. I fancy learning to ski. Lisa thought winter holidays should be spent somewhere warm and refused to have anything to do with snow. Elliot thought it was great. Winter holidays with me, summer holidays with Lisa. Although our relationship seemed to improve from time to time. On the whole we started to develop our lives in different directions. I wasn't an ideal husband. Most of the time I didn't know what Lisa was doing and, to make it worse, I didn't care. I felt that she'd already turned her back on me and it was obvious that we both wanted different things. Maybe I should have done something about it then but I had promised for better or worse and I always kept my promises. If Lisa wanted to call it a day, then it was up to her. By the time Elliot went to university we were leading separate lives. We shared a bed but that was about all. Elliot was influenced more by his mother than me and decided to study business. I can't pretend I wasn't disappointed but, hell, the country needs businessmen. I tried to give him some holiday work at Danvers, but his mother said he should be enjoying himself and of course, he didn't argue with her. He graduated with second-class honors and joined a management consultancy in London. It was during these three years that I started to hear stories about Lisa's behavior. Even Bob Danvers told me where he'd seen her and with whom. My secretary made faces at the telephone whenever it was Lisa on the line. I never knew whether or not she still had any love for me, but it was clear to me that she had no respect for me at all. When I came home that night to find her gone, I was more relieved than anything else. I still don't understand how you wouldn't know we were looking for you. Mrs. Bryant, Inspector Maynard said. The search and your husband's arrest was in all the newspapers. Lisa looked across at me. They arrested you? Oh, Kevin, I'm so sorry. I didn't expect anything like that to happen. I left you a note. Yes, you did, computer printed and unsigned. No one believed it. Frankly, Mrs. Bryant, I'm having difficulty accepting that you didn't know about the search. It was in all the newspapers and your husband's arrest was carried by the foreign news media. Inspector. I was in a foreign country and couldn't speak the language. The only news I saw was on the television, and that was in French. I had no idea what was going on here. And you didn't much care, I added. Lisa turned to me. No, Kevin, to be completely honest, you're right. I didn't care what was happening here. We hadn't been on the same wavelength for years. You couldn't stand my friends, and I didn't have much interest in your life. But you have to believe me, I didn't want to cause you any trouble. WPC Cavendish had left the room to use her radio. She came back and passed a paper to Inspector Maynard. Mrs. Bryant. Will you stop calling her Mrs. Bryant? I said. She's not Mrs. Bryant. She's my ex-wife with the emphasis on the ex. 
Lisa looked confused, and the inspector was stuck for words. Okay, Lisa, is that your Range Rover outside? Yes, it is. Why? Well, it seems the Spanish police have been looking for it, and you, in connection with a death in a bordello in Malaga. He just died in the girl's room. It was nothing to do with me. So I believe. The case has been dropped. The postmortem said it was a heart attack. The Spanish police are a little annoyed with you for leaving the country while the case was still open. I just had to get away. Away from those horrible people. You were right about them, Kevin. They just use people to get what they want, then drop them. Okay. Mrs. Sorry. Lisa, I think we're done. We'd like you to come to the station sometime to provide a statement, but as far as I'm concerned it's case closed. I walked Inspector Maynard and the WPC to the door. As he left he turned and offered me his hand. Thank you Mr. Bryant and good luck for tomorrow. Thank you Inspector. Goodbye. I watched them go and heaved a sigh of relief. I closed the door and waited for the next visit. I can't say I didn't miss Lisa, because I did. The house was empty, and you even miss the arguments when they're not there. However, things could have been worse. She'd left her bank and credit cards, so at least I didn't have to worry about her taking all our money. She even left her brand new mini, something that pleased me because I was paying for it. I took some time off the following day and went into the bank, surrendered Lisa's cards and took her name off the accounts. I took Lisa at her word. She'd said don't try to find me, so I didn't. I didn't even report her missing. It was 10 days later when Elliot called that things took a turn for the worse. Elliot couldn't believe his mother would just leave like that. He insisted on involving the police and came home to file a missing person report. That was when I first met Inspector Maynard. He seemed to be most interested in the fact that I hadn't reported her missing. After a couple of weeks, he returned to tell me they'd got nowhere trying to find Lisa. None of the local taxi drivers had picked her up and they didn't think she'd use the bus. I laughed at the last statement. Lisa hadn't used a bus since the day we got married. Mr. Bryant, do you have any idea where your wife would have gone? Or who she might have left with? He'd asked me. I have no idea and I don't much care, Inspector, had been my reply. Of course, after that he wanted to know about our relationship and I told him the truth. I had been brought up to do that. Tell the truth and shame the devil, my mum had always said. She'd obviously never dealt with a policeman eager to make a name for himself. My admission that we were like two people who shared a house and sometimes had sex didn't do me any good. I knew something was afoot two days later when I left for work and found half the world's press camped on my front lawn. As I walked to the garage, I could hear shouts from the reporters. Where is your wife, Mr. Bryant? Is she dead, Mr. Bryant? Are you a suspect, Mr. Bryant? I backed my old Skoda out of the garage, and as I went back to close the door I got more of the same questions fired at me. As I got back in the car I simply said, you people know as much, if not more, than I do. I was in a meeting with Bob Danvers when Maynard turned up again. Mr. Bryant, I have here a warrant to search your house and grounds, and another to impound and examine your car. I must ask you to accompany me back to your house in order to guarantee full access. I looked at Bob and sighed, rolling my eyes. Look, Inspector. If you want to search my house, that's fine. Here are my keys, and these are the keys for the car. You'll find it in the car park. I really don't think you need me. I handed over both sets of keys. Now, Inspector, Mr. Danvers, and I have important business to discuss. What followed took me completely by surprise. Inspector Maynard took hold of my left hand and clamped one side of a pair of handcuffs on my wrist. Kevin Bryant, I am arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Mrs. Lisa Bryant. You're not obliged to say anything but it may harm your defense if you do not mention, when questioned, something you later rely on in court. Now please stand, sir, and put your hands behind you. I did as instructed, the other cuff was locked on my right wrist, and I was led from the room. As I went out of the door, Bob called out to me. I'll call the company lawyer. Don't say anything until he gets there. For two days, they kept me in the cells at the police station with several interviews each day. I followed Bob Danvers' instructions and refused to say anything without my solicitor present. At the end of two days, Maynard applied to the court for more time to question me, but my solicitor challenged him to produce any evidence that a crime had actually been committed. Maynard had to accept that there was no evidence and I was released. Someone had tipped off the press and there was a gang of photographers waiting as I walked out to the waiting cab. When the taxi pulled up outside my house, I could hardly believe my eyes. The garden and the house were cordoned off with tape bearing the legend, Crime Scene. Do not cross. The gate to the back garden was off its hinges and the front door was open. I used my phone to take photos. I asked the taxi driver to wait while I packed a case. Walking straight through the tape, I entered my house. The sight was unbelievable. 
Downstairs the carpets had been ripped up and I could see two mechanical diggers and a number of policemen digging large holes in my garden. The patio had already been ripped up. I was about to go up to my bedroom when a policeman came down the stairs. What are you doing here? Can't you read? It says, crime scene, do not cross. First, there has been no crime, and second, this is my house. I live here. The policeman used his radio to ask permission to let me in, then looked back at me. Why are you here? Well, I certainly can't live here, so I need to pack a case to move out. He says he needs to pack a case, sir, he said into the radio. Okay, sir, you can do that, but I have to supervise you so I can check what you take. Upstairs, all the carpets had been ripped up. There were floorboards up in every room and a ladder up to the loft hatch. I took photos as I went. In the bedroom, I found the contents of my wardrobe draped over the bed and the contents of the drawers spread about the room. As best I could, I collected up what clothes I needed. My suitcase was already out on the floor and I put what I could find into it. I got back in the taxi and asked the driver to take me to a hotel. The next day, I saw my picture splashed across the tabloid newspapers. One, the Morning Post, captioned the photo with the headline, Getting Away with Murder. The pigs will pay for that, I thought. When I got into work, I walked across the factory floor, and someone started clapping. As more people noticed me, the applause grew louder. As I reached the door to the offices, I turned, took a very theatrical bow, and the applause turned to laughter. Sally, my secretary, welcomed me with a kiss on the cheek. I knew it couldn't be true, she told me as she put a cup of coffee down on the desk. Within minutes, Bob Danvers was in my office. Good to see you back where you belong, Kevin. The lawyers told me what happened. How are you? I'm fine, Bob. I wish I could say the same for my house. They've wrecked the place. I showed Bob the pictures on my phone. Print those out for me, and I'll get them over to the lawyers. It seems to me they've no right calling your house a crime scene when they don't even know that a crime's been committed. Then there's the damage they've done. You deserve to be compensated for that. Come to think of it, where are you living? You can't live in that mess. I spent last night in a hotel. I thought I'd stay there until the weekend then try to find a short-term furnished flat. You'll do no such thing. Wendy and I have plenty of room. You can live with us for a while until we find you somewhere suitable to stay. Just you remember, Kevin, you have friends here, and friends help each other. Now don't forget to give me those pictures. He left my office and I got to work. As I was on my way out to lunch, Sally called out to me. Kevin, Bob asked me to find you somewhere to live, but I don't really know what to look for. If you don't want a hotel, do you want a flat? Or would a bed and breakfast do? Would you consider being someone's lodger? I hadn't given it much thought. Really, Sally? The reason I ask is that my Aunt Helen takes in lodgers, and she doesn't have anyone at present. Are you sure she'd be okay with having a murder suspect in her house? You're no murderer, she laughed. Anyway, we don't even know if there has been a murder. Well, if you check your aunt and uncle are happy, it might be a good solution. I'll phone Aunt Helen this afternoon. Oh, by the way, there is no uncle. He died five years ago. That afternoon Sally called her aunt and arranged for me to visit her that evening. I took the pictures into Bob and told him that I wouldn't need his offer of help. Helen Warrender was a fine-looking woman. She was in her early fifties, though at first glance you'd have put her age closer to forty. She was five foot six inches tall with a slim waist and a delightful curve to her hips. She had piercing blue eyes and shoulder-length dark hair which was graying but not yet gray. She had a nice home and when she showed me the double room she had available, I was convinced I should take it. I felt it only right to make sure that she was fully in the picture. Her response sealed the deal. Sally told me all about it. I think it's disgusting they should treat you like that. I had forgotten what it was like to have someone look after me. Every morning I was treated to the sight of the lovely Helen serving me with breakfast. She insisted I didn't restrict myself to my bedroom. This is a big house for me, Mr. Bryant, and I do get lonely. Just having someone else in the room of an evening is welcome. As the weeks went by, I came to realize that lodging with Helen was better than living with Lisa, with the exception of the occasional sex. Even the latter resolved itself as time went by. One night I came back to find Helen in a panic. She couldn't stop water flowing through the toilet cistern. I told her not to worry, found the stopcock and turned it off. I inspected the cistern, found the problem and after a quick trip to the do-it-yourself store, I fitted a new valve and turned the water on again. Helen was completely overwhelmed with gratitude. She hugged me tightly and kissed me on the lips. Possibly it was because it had been so long, but more likely it was the feeling of Helen's body against mine. My Johnny started to swell and pressed against her as I kissed her back. We stood there for several moments looking into each other's eyes. It feels like you need something as much as I do. Take me to bed, Kevin. 
Take me now. I swept her up in my arms and carried her up to her bedroom. I put her back on her feet and kissed her again. I eased the zip of her dress down below her waist, lifted it off her shoulders, and let it fall to the floor. For a while I stood and looked at her. Don't look too closely, she said. It's all seen better days. Well, if it has, I'd like to have seen it. It looks pretty good to me right now. Oh, you say the nicest things. We quickly undressed and pounced on each other. Be gentle, Kevin. It's been a long time. Don't worry, I won't do anything you don't want. I pulled her to me and held her tightly. As I kissed her tenderly, she brought a hand around and pulled my head closer. Her lips parted and our tongues danced a sensual rumba. My hands ran down her back. We shouldn't be doing this, but I want it so much. Don't worry, everything will be fine. Oh, yes, Kevin. I need this so much. Please, please take me now. Well, who was I to say no? We had some wild sex. After the session, as we lay there I stroked her back and kissed her shoulders. Gently I rolled her onto her back and got up to get us both a glass of wine. We sat, we drank, and then we screwed some more until eventually Helen fell asleep. There are many times in a person's life when they think, what would have happened if I had done things differently? This was such a time for me. I decided to go back to my own room and leave Helen to sleep. I've often wondered what would have happened had I stayed with her that night. The following morning things were back to normal. Helen was waiting on me, and I was Mr. Bryan again. That evening, I invited Helen to go to dinner with me. Mr. Bryant, Kevin, what happened last night was a mistake. It should never have happened. But it did happen, Helen, and it was good, wasn't it? Yes, it was good. It was more than good. But it was wrong. You're still married and I, I have someone. You have someone? Then why last night? He's old school. He won't take me to bed until we're married. But it has been so long since I felt a real man inside me. I'm so sorry, Kevin, that I took advantage of you but it must never happen again. Helen, if a man has the opportunity to make love to you and turns it down, I have doubts about his sanity. Nevertheless, we have an agreement and I will marry him. So, you see, last night must never happen again. Like I said last night, Helen, I won't do anything you don't want me to do. I kept my promise to her, but in the three months I spent with her we had another two nights of passion. Each was followed by similar guilt on her part. The police occupied my house for over a month and when I was handed back the keys the place was far from habitable. It took almost two months to get it back in a condition I could live with. Much of my furniture had to be replaced, and the garden was a mess. Well, said Lisa, looks like you haven't been celibate while I've been away. What do you mean by that? This place. If I'm not mistaken, I see a woman's touch in the decoration. The colors and the furniture, definitely not your choice. I paid someone else to do it. When the police were finished with it, I either had to completely refurbish it or sell up. Since I'd paid off the mortgage and didn't want to start again, I got a designer in and we made it better. Was it that bad then? I'll show you the pictures if you like. They even checked I hadn't buried you under the concrete floor. Oh, Kevin, I never imagined anything like that. I really am very sorry. It's water under the bridge now, Lisa. We're divorced and both free agents. And to be honest, that's all that matters to me now. You keep saying that. How can we be divorced without me knowing about it? I haven't agreed to it, and I still won't. You don't have to, Lisa. You deserted me. Once I'd moved back home, I looked into divorcing Lisa. I'd got to the point where I wanted to forget all about her. While I was living with her, she was doing her best to humiliate me, and even now she was gone, she was still causing me problems. My solicitor advised me to wait for a while so he could sound out the courts to see what I'd need to do to show that Lisa had left and wasn't coming back. It was two months before he came back to me. I need to know what you want out of this divorce, Mr. Bryant, as it has some bearing on what you'll have to do. If you want to take all your joint assets, then it'll take longer. It's possible, especially since she left her bank cards. This will be taken as your wife not wanting any of your assets. I said it will take longer because you'll have to show that you've made every effort to contact your wife and inform her of your intentions. And if I want a quicker option? Well, the quicker option involves you in setting up a trust fund for your wife which would have to be worth up to half your joint assets. The court would say exactly how much that would actually have to be, but the important thing is, should your wife reappear, then she'd be able to claim the money she might have been awarded had she defended the case. I think we'll take the long route. I'm in no hurry. Okay, Mr. Bryant, I'll get started on the paperwork right away. I thanked him and left him to start the work. It didn't take long before Inspector Maynard got wind of the divorce terms I was pursuing. He sent a couple of his gentlemen round to invite me to come into the station for an interview. He may have thought that he'd found a motive, but he still had nothing to indicate that Lisa hadn't just left. 
which of course she had. Once again, as I left I had to run the gauntlet of the press. Strange how they always seemed to know when I'd been questioned. The police had left me plenty of work to do in the garden. Although I had no plans to do it all myself, I certainly intended to design it. Even with garden design and my everyday work, I still found myself feeling very alone. I registered with a couple of internet dating sites and found myself surprisingly popular. The problem was that, almost always during the first date, the woman would say, Do you think your wife will ever come back? Of course, what they meant was, Did you murder your wife? I felt I was often being dated for my curiosity value. I had no problem getting sex, but as to finding anyone I'd want to live with, I was having no luck. I started to look at other sites, ones that focused just on getting laid. I never tried them, just looked to see what was available. I was surprised to find girls of 18 and 19 advertising. One girl in particular caught my eye. I tried to ignore her, but time and time again I found myself drawn back to her profile. Jane was being remarkably open and upfront. The more often I read the profile, the more naive she seemed. Profile. I've just started at uni and, thanks to the tuition fees, I need some financial help. I'm not talking about designer dresses and Gucci bags. Just help me avoid the drudgery of a job. In return, I will be yours exclusively. If you're married, I will be your secret girlfriend. Not interested in one-night stands or short-term relationships. I looked at her picture and read the profile and imagined all of the creeps she'd get responding to that at. After a while, I could almost convince myself that if I contacted her, it would protect her from all the perverts. It had nothing to do with her youthful good looks. In the end, I could resist no longer. I contacted her and set up an appointment. I sat in the bar of the university theater nursing a cup of coffee. I was just wondering how the staff managed to concentrate on their jobs with all these nubile nymphs around. When I saw her, I'd studied her photo so often that I recognized her immediately. I stood up and motioned her over. She was almost at my table when I realized she'd brought a friend. Jane was about five foot six, with slim hips and an ample bosom, wearing jeans and a sweater. Her shape was immediately noticeable. Her high cheeks, full lips and big brown eyes were the reason I'd been drawn to her picture, and now I could see her long mousy brown hair. Her friend was smaller, with short blonde hair. Her frame was somewhat slight, but she was still an attractive girl. Hello, I'm Jane, and this is my friend, Abby, she said, holding her hand out for me to shake. Abby stood back and took my picture with her phone. Hi, I'm Kevin, can I get you ladies a drink? I'll have a coffee. That's the reason I suggested we meet here. It's the only place on campus that serves good coffee. What about you, Abby? What would you like? Just water, thanks. They sat down at my table, and I went to the bar for the drinks. When I got back to the table, Jane looked more relaxed than either me or Abby. I gave them their drinks and sat down. Well, you've passed the physical, Jane said with a smile. I could do it with you. Well, that's comforting to know. You have me at a disadvantage, though. You seem to have this all worked out, while I still can't believe I'm doing this. Abby just sat there shooting icy glances in my direction. Are you married, Kevin? I can be very discreet. You don't have to worry. It's not my wife that worries me. I'm worried for you. Are you sure you really want to do this? Suddenly, she looked angry. Is that why you've come here? To try and talk me out of it? She pushed her coffee away and started to get up. I reached out and held onto her hands. Please sit down. I was just checking that you were sure. Now, what is it you want from me? Well, you can cover that for a start, she said, putting an invoice on the table. The invoice was for her halls of residence accommodation. 360 pounds for 10 weeks. I smiled to myself. Lisa would have spent that much on a pair of shoes. I took out my checkbook and wrote one for the full amount, made out to the university estates department. I held the check out for her. She took it and studied it. The full amount, up front. You would do that for me? Yes, I'll do that and I'll do it again next term. But there are conditions. You must cancel that ad and there is to be no one else. Of course, that goes without saying. Good, then here's what I propose. I'll pay your rent, your food bills and your books, and next year I'll pay your tuition fees. In return I expect you to be diligent in your studies and to be available to me for social events and engagements. Social events and engagements. Huh, I've never heard it called that before, muttered Abby. Now Jane, do we have a deal? Jane fixed me with those big brown eyes. We most certainly do. Good. Now, unless you two ladies have already eaten, may I take you to dinner? Now hold on, Mr. Pervert, Abby interjected. I'm not part of this deal. I'm just here for Jane's protection. I appreciate that, Abby. I really do, and that's why I'd like you to come. Call it a thank you for looking after our mutual friend. With that we, 
all three, left the theater and walked across campus to where I left my car. They were somewhat surprised to see the Skoda. As we got in the girls looked at each other and then to me. Jane reached out and put her hand on mine. Kevin, can you really afford to do this? Of course I can. I wouldn't have offered if I couldn't. She looked at Abby again, then back at me. Sorry, I didn't mean to doubt you. It's just that this isn't the car a wealthy man drives. My dad has one of these. It's older, of course, but it's the same car. I laughed out loud and only stopped when I realized how embarrassed she was. Oh, Jane, you just reminded me of my wife. She couldn't understand it either. You see, I'm a man who lives his life according to his needs, not according to his means. This is a good reliable car, and it was good value for money. That leaves me more cash to spend on the important things in life. And I'm important? I hope you'll become so. I really do. My wife has left me. My son finished university and has moved to the big city to make his fortune. The two of them cost me far more than I'll be spending on you, so don't worry about whether I can afford it. We had a very pleasant meal at a little Italian restaurant in Bath. I let Jane do most of the talking, and before the end of the evening I found out that her father was in his early 60s and her mother was almost 20 years his junior. They lived in Doncaster, where Jane had grown up. Her father had a second family to keep, so they were far from well off, but he had instilled in his daughter a healthy dislike for debt. Dad always says that borrowing is like paying someone money simply because they have more than you in the first place, she told me. I liked the sound of her father, even if it did mean his daughter was taking big risks to avoid being in debt. Of course, she hadn't told him what she was doing. As far as he was concerned, she worked in the campus bar. At the end of the evening, we exchanged phone numbers, and I drove them back to their halls of residence. I may have been acting like an old fool, but I wasn't totally stupid. The next day I called the company lawyer and asked for the name of the inquiry agent they used. I gave the guy all the details I had and asked him to find out all he could. I didn't think she was taking me for a ride, but it made sense to be sure before I got in any deeper. In the meantime I took things very gently. In the first two weeks I took her out a couple of times a week. We went out to dinner, and we went to clubs. I knew I was becoming attached to her, but I tried to keep her at arm's length, at least until I got the report from the inquiry agent. At least that was the plan. The problem was that Jane hadn't read the script. One Saturday I decided to take her out to one of my favorite restaurants, so that afternoon I took her shopping for appropriate clothes. Then that night we went into town and had a wonderful evening, first at the restaurant then at a nightclub. I had booked us into a hotel, with separate rooms of course. As we walked into the hotel that night Jane had hold of my arm with both hands and her head was on my shoulder. As we got to our rooms we stopped outside her door. I attempted to kiss her on the cheek, but she turned so that our lips met. I kissed her gently, but she took my head in both of her hands and kissed me back with a passion. We need to talk, she said. We could do that in your room, but I'd rather it was mine. She turned, opened the door and gently led me in. She sat me down on the bed and walked to the minibar. Shall we have a drink? She got out two small bottles of wine and came back with two glasses. Kevin, I'm very grateful to you for helping me, but I thought we had a deal. We do have a deal. I've kept to my side of it, haven't I? Sort of, but you haven't let me hold up my side of the deal. We said you'd meet my expenses and in return you get me, exclusively. I really enjoy going out with you, and how could I not like dresses like this? She reached up her back and I heard the zip being pulled down. She pushed the dress off her shoulders, let it fall to the floor, then stepped out of it. She stood before me wearing only stockings, red lacy bra, and matching thong. She looked down at my lap and could see the tint forming there. I know you find me attractive, so why do you treat me more like your daughter than your girlfriend? I already have a father. I don't need another one. She sat on the bed and held my hand. I'm just not used to arrangements like this. I suppose I'm trying to break us both in gently. I don't want you to feel like a hooker. Is that what you think I'm doing? If I was a hooker, clients would be choosing me and trying to make deals. A hooker isn't in control of the relationship. I'm in control of this relationship. I chose you, not the other way around. If you're unhappy with that, we can end it now. Okay, I was trying to protect myself as well as you. I'm a man in his 40s, you're 19. How long is it going to be before some young student captures your heart and you want out of our arrangement? Where is that going to leave me? She got up, then sat on my lap and stroked my face. That's not going to happen. I don't go for young men. They're all so wham-bam. Thank you, ma'am. I want a mature man. I want you, Kevin. Not just for the money. I really enjoy being with you. Right now, I want you to ravage me. Isn't that what you want? Damn right it was what I wanted. I quickly undressed her. I obliged and we had sex. After a great session, we lay there for several minutes. 
just enjoying the closeness of each other. I was struck by the difference between this lithe young body and the softer older woman I was used to. I was also conscious of the difference between her body and mine. Yes, the bit of exercise I did had kept me reasonably fit, but I was getting a bit soft and floppy. Would you like to share a shower with me? She asked. Try to keep me out. She got off the bed and ran for the bathroom. I followed. With the water spraying down on us we kissed and cuddled. After the shower, we went back on the bed. I held her tight, and after a few more kisses I lay on my back and she snuggled under my arm with her head on my chest. So did you really choose me? I asked. Of course I did. You didn't think you were the first candidate, did you? Well, I hadn't really thought of it until tonight. But yes, I suppose I did. No, there were many who wanted to have me. You were the first one who really wanted to look after me. One fat old man wanted to go back to my room so that he could see what he was getting. You just gave me the money, and if I hadn't forced the issue tonight, you still wouldn't have had anything for your money. Please don't say it like that. Getting something for my money. It makes it sound like I'm paying you for sex. I don't see it like that at all. Oh, Kevin, I know you don't, and neither do I. That's why you were special. Add to that, I really fancied you. And when we all went out to dinner, you were so charming I've wanted to go to bed with you ever since. She hugged me. So how did you see our little arrangement? She asked. I don't know. I think I wanted to protect you. I desired you sexually, of course but you're 20 years younger than me. I only wanted you in my bed if that's where you wanted to be. Well, it is, so please, no more separate rooms. I hugged her close then she turned over and we spooned. We must have drifted off to sleep because the next thing I knew, I was waking up to the sound of Jane talking to someone. I'd like to thank you for such a wonderful night. Now what can I give you to say thanks? How about a nice big kiss? At first, I thought she must be on the phone, but that last question forced me to open my eyes. As soon as I opened my eyes, I got a kiss on my lips and soon we started having sex again. After that I went to take a shower. After a shower, I had to go back to my own room for a change of clothes before going down to breakfast. We left the hotel with my arm around her shoulder and hers around my waist. We had arrived looking like father and daughter and we left looking like lovers. On Monday morning I called the inquiry agent and asked for a verbal report. He told me what I hoped to hear. Everything was just as she'd said and as far as he could tell she had no love interest at university. In fact, the lads had found her so hard to crack that there were some rumors that she and Abby were partners. I thanked him for his efforts, told him the case was now closed, and asked him to send his account direct to me. I asked Sally if she had details of the gym that gave the company employees a discount and told her to book me an appointment with the personal trainer. She gave me a peculiar look. What's with the sudden desire for fitness? Well, Sally, I thought this old body was somewhat out of shape. It's not that bad and it's not that old, she hesitated then gave me a knowing smile. You've found someone, haven't you? Oh my God. You have, you've really found someone. Oh, Kevin, I'm so pleased. She rushed over and kissed me full on the lips then pulled back looking embarrassed. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I'm just so happy for you. I can't wait to tell everybody. I'd rather you said nothing, Sally. Who knows how long these things last. I'd rather people found out in the fullness of time. Any girl that lets you go has got to be mad or stupid. That's all I've got to say. Well, thank you, Sally, and I promise not to tell your husband you said that. Oh, he knows. He heard me and Aunt Helen talking about you. If I didn't love him so much I'd have made a play for you myself. Well, I just hope he knows what a lucky man he is. Now can we get some work done around here? She left my office in a state of excitement, and I wondered just how long she could keep a lid on things. Things had moved on at Danvers. We were into chip design, specializing in digital signal processing. Our manufacturing side was still working, but the biggest money spinner was from licenses to use our designs. This was mainly my doing. Design and development had expanded fast, and we were employing two new graduates every year. Meanwhile, Bob, now in his 60s, was looking to take more of a back seat. I just got back from seeing the personal trainer when he came into my office. He looked at my red face and sweaty forehead. My God, you look like you've just run a mile, he said. Three actually, Bob. What can I do for you? It's your mileage expenses, you're costing me a fortune. They're all legitimate expenses, Bob. I don't count the short hops. I know that. If I thought you were cheating me, you wouldn't be sitting there. No, I think the company would be better off if you had a company car. So you'd better choose one. And no, it's not going to be a bloody Skoda. There's nothing wrong with Skoda. You get a lot more car for your money. All right, all right, I know the arguments. But the fact of the matter is... It doesn't give the impression of a successful company if the acting CEO rolls up in a Skoda. Make it a Merc, 
Jag, or Beamer, something with a bit of prestige attached to it. Hold on, Bob, just back up a bit. What did you say about acting CEO? Oh, didn't I tell you about that? Wendy and I are going on a world cruise after Christmas. We'll be gone a couple of months. I'm putting you in charge while I'm away. We'll talk about what happens after that, when I get back. Wendy wants to see more of me, so I'll be looking to take more of a back seat. Now get on that computer of yours and find yourself a car. You can spend up to 80 grand. It took me two weeks to sort out the car. I didn't say a word to Jane about it. We were seeing each other about four nights a week, and most nights she'd stay over at the house, and I would drive her into college in the mornings before going to work. The night I pulled up in the new Jag XK, she didn't even realize it was me. I had to get out of the car before she realized. Well, I said, does this tell you that I can afford to support you? You silly man, you didn't buy this just to impress me? No, it's a company car. My boss made me have it. Jane looked around the interior of the car. Your boss must think a hell of a lot of you. You know, I think he does. Now, where would you like to go tonight? I don't care where we go, as long as I'm with you. Can't we just go to your place and sit and watch TV or something? That was when I really started to feel comfortable with the relationship. We didn't have to go out. She was content just to be with me. My own double bed hadn't seen so much action in years, and for the first time in ages I felt happy. Of course it couldn't last, and one evening I pulled up at the university in the usual place, but she wasn't there. I went to her room, but there was no answer. I tried the theater bar to no avail. I didn't think I could feel any worse, and when I got back to my car and found Abby sitting on the front wing, my mood lifted a little. Abby, where is she? Has something happened? Is she all right? For such a slight girl, she packed a hell of a slap. My cheek stung as she laid into me verbally. Why couldn't you be straight with us? If you told us who you were in the first place, she wouldn't be breaking her heart right now. I have been straight with you. I am Kevin Bryant. Look, it's on my driving license. I know you're Kevin Bryant. You're the Kevin Bryant, the man who got away with murder. Just where is your wife, Kevin? I don't know. She left me. I told you that. Then how come nobody can find her? The reporter was right. If she was still alive, someone would know where she is. Reporter? What reporter? The man from the Post. He said he wanted to interview her, and then told her he was doing a piece on why some women were attracted to murderers. Jane defended you, and told him that it couldn't be true, but then he showed her all the newspaper stories. I'll bet he did. Stories he's written. I've had enough of this. Just because Lisa disappeared doesn't mean I'm not entitled to a life of my own, and I want Jane to be a part of that life. I got back in the car and started her up. Don't hold your breath, Abby called after me as I roared out of the car park. When I got home, I made several attempts to call Jane. Every time I was told that her phone was switched off. In the end, I sent a text. It's not true. Lisa did leave me. Nobody killed her. Please talk to me. I didn't sleep well that night and I was still angry when I got into work the next day. I barely said good morning to Sally. Sally, get me Guy Pearson, from the company lawyers, on the phone. Certainly, Kevin. Would you like your coffee now? Not now, thanks. Maybe later. A few minutes later my phone rang. I've got Guy Pearson for you. Guy Pearson, how can I help you? It's Kevin Bryant, Mr. Pearson, from Danvers Electronics. I'm still having problems with the police and the press regarding my wife's disappearance. I told him what had happened and how things had affected my life since the story broke. What would you like me to do, Mr. Bryant? Take the pigs to the cleaners, the police, the press, and most especially the post. It will be my pleasure, Mr. Bryant. I have all the evidence. I've just been waiting for your instructions. Guy, if you can make sure it gets maximum news coverage, I would be much obliged. Will do, Mr. Bryant. Leave it with me. The next day I knew that Pearson had made a start. As I opened my front door, I had TV cameras thrust in my face, and the question started. Mr. Bryant, is it true that you're suing the police, sir? Yes, it's true. Don't you think they have a responsibility to investigate your wife's disappearance, sir? Yes, they do, but they also have a responsibility to get their facts right. They had no right to label my house as a crime scene when no crime had been committed. What about the post, sir? Is it true that you're claiming a million pounds? I don't know. I left that in the hands of my solicitor. What have they done that could possibly be worth that much money, sir? The press, and the post in particular, have, without a shred of evidence, labeled me a murderer. If the post has any evidence to suggest that my wife is dead, then I and the police would like to see it. Despite this lack of evidence, staff writers from the Post have deliberately interfered in my private life, wrecking new relationships I might have formed. What price do you put on that, gentlemen? Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get to work. 
I got into the Jag and made my exit. At work things were normal. Just after lunch I got a call from Guy Pearson congratulating me on my doorstep interview. It wasn't really Guy I was trying to impress, but he was the only person to call me about it. That night I saw the TV coverage, and generally it seemed quite positive. My interview was followed by an article about press intrusion and featured other people whose lives had been ruined. Within three days, I got the offer of an out-of-court settlement. No apology and no admission of liability. No deal. The offer was encouraging, but what I found when I got home was the best thing. It was a cold, dark evening, and she was huddled up against the cold. I left the car on the drive and walked over to her. As she got up, I threw my arms around her to warm her. Without a word, I opened the front door and ushered her in. I sat her down and went to the kitchen to make the coffee. When I returned with the tray, she looked warmer but very nervous. I poured the coffee and passed her a cup. She wrapped her hands around the cup. I just looked at her. I'm sorry, Kevin. I don't know what to say. How about I start at the beginning and tell you everything? I did just that, from the beginning, and left nothing out. By the time I finished, my coffee was cold and Jane had tears in her eyes. I sat next to her and put my arm around her. She put her head on my chest and cried. I'm really sorry, Kevin. I should have talked to you about it, but that horrible man frightened me so much. I have a feeling he's going to regret that. So he should. He said horrible things about you. And when he showed me all those stories in the papers, I couldn't believe they could write those things without any proof. When I saw you on the television, challenging them to provide the evidence, I knew I'd been a fool. Abby said you were brokenhearted. I was. You see, I really like you. The sex is great, but it's more than that. I wanted to be with you, but he frightened me so much. I hugged her while she cried, and when she stopped crying I made us some dinner. She seemed to brighten up after dinner, and we just sat together. Then, just before we went to bed, she spoke. Kevin, I know I've no right to ask, but would you come home with me for Christmas? I want you to meet my dad and my mom, of course, but mainly my dad. I'd really like that, I said. We went to bed and just held each other. We made love slowly and tenderly that night. Meanwhile, Lisa broke my thoughts. Well, I have to say the last six years have been kind to you, Kevin. Sorry, what was that? I said you're looking well. In fact, I think you look younger and fitter than you were when I left. Well, I decided I needed to get into better shape. Add to that the dancing and cycling I've been doing. You? Dancing and cycling? What brought that on? I can't help being an old dad to any more children I have, but I don't have to be a fat old dad. You plan on having more children? At your age? I'm 48, Lisa, not 84. Charlie Chaplin was still siring children at 82. Yes, but he had a young wife. And what makes you think I couldn't get a young wife? Oh my God, Kevin. You haven't bought yourself a Russian bride, have you? She still hadn't learned her lesson, it seemed. I'd have put her straight, but at that moment the doorbell rang. I went to answer it, knowing it was likely to be my son, Elliot. I opened the door. Hi, Dad. Is she still here? I showed him in. Elliot, how are you, darling? Fat lot you care. You piss off for six years, then come back and think everything's going to be the same as it was. It doesn't work like that, Mom. People move on. But I always loved you. You're my darling boy. You know that. Just not enough to let me know you were still alive, though. I didn't want your father to find me. What makes you think I wanted to? I added. So where have you been these last six years, mother dear? There was more than a hint of irony in his voice. He must have inherited something from me. She's been running a Spanish bordello, I told him. Madam Lisa. I really wasn't helping matters, so I left them to it. I drifted back to my thoughts. We didn't go up to Doncaster straight away when term ended. Jane and I quickly got over our little upset, and she spent some time moving into the house. It had been her suggestion. Rather than me paying for her student accommodation, I could just provide the accommodation. It made sense to me. She was spending as many nights in my house as she was in her room. I insisted that she used Elliot's old room. After all, there would be nights when she'd need to work, and she might just need to get away from me. There was the small worry about transport, but Lisa's mini was still in the garage, so I let her use that. The journey up to Doncaster was uneventful. The Jag just ate up the miles. We stopped a couple of times at the motorway services for overpriced, bad food and arrived in the center of Doncaster in the early evening. The satin AV took me straight to my hotel. When I pulled into the car park, Jane's face had a curious expression. What are we doing here? We can't stay here. My parents will be very upset if we don't stay with them. I've taken a room here as insurance. I'm sure your mom and dad will be thrilled to see you, but maybe less thrilled to see me. I'm sure they'll love you, but I suppose some insurance isn't a bad idea. 
We checked in and I took some luggage up to my room. Jane came up with me to help unpack and to see what the room was like. Hmm, so this is what an executive double room looks like. I love the bed. We'll have to make an excuse to come back and try it out. We made our way to a nice little semi-detached on the outskirts of town. I parked the car in the drive, and as we reached the front door it was opened by a man in his 60s. His gray hair was thinning. He was a little overweight and had the look of a man who was once a lady killer. Jane threw her arms around him. Dad, how are you? I'm fine, darling. How are you? You're certainly looking well. This must be Kevin. Come into the light, my boy. Let me get a look at you. I stepped forward and took his hand to shake it. He brought his other hand round and placed it on top of mine as we shook hands. You're very welcome, my boy. Our Jane's told me a lot about you. Now come in and meet the wife. I followed him in with Jane's suitcase and my overnight bag. I put the bags down in the hall and followed Jane and her dad into the kitchen. The greeting between Jane and her mom was somewhat cooler. Her mother was about the same age as me. She was about 5 foot 4 inches, slim build with shoulder length blonde hair. In her day she would have been quite a looker, still could be if she tried a bit harder. As they hugged, Jane's mother looked straight past her to me. And who's this? She asked. Mom, this is Kevin. He's a friend, and we're going to be sharing a house. Sharing a house or sharing a bed? Jane has her own room, Mrs. Draper, I said and offered her my hand. My offer was ignored. Jane gripped my arm and put her head on my shoulder. Can we offer you two a drink and maybe some food? Asked Jane's father. I'd love a coffee, please, Mr. Draper, I said. Oh, please call me Derek and this is Linda. I'll have a coffee as well, please, Dad, especially if it's the good stuff. Derek Draper laughed. She takes after her father, Kevin. She appreciates a good cup of coffee. Oh, I know that, Derek. That's how we met. There's only one place on campus that serves good coffee. So we both ended up there, sat at the same table. I really liked Derek, and he obviously had a good relationship with Jane. Linda was a different matter. I'm not without a certain amount of charm, but it didn't seem to work on Jane's mother. She was always cool towards me, and I frequently found her staring at me. Christmas passed very amiably, but the day before New Year's Eve the TV showed a review of the year. When it got to November everything changed. This was the month when businessman Kevin Bryant took his fight for justice to the courts, having, he claimed, been persecuted by the police and the press, the reporter said. Linda Draper brought her hand up to her mouth. Oh my God, you're him aren't you? She said, looking at me. You're Kevin Bryant, the man who got away with murder. No, Linda, I'm Kevin Bryant, the man whose wife left him. The post says you murdered her. There's no smoke without fire. Oh my God. My daughter's going out with a murderer. Linda, Kevin's our guest, and I'm proud to live in a country where a man is innocent until proven guilty. Now, he asked them to provide evidence that his wife's dead, but they can't. You knew. You knew and you didn't tell me. I've had a murderer under my roof and you knew. Technically, Linda, it's my roof, and I'm happy to have Kevin here. I stood up and looked at them both. Derek, I'm sorry but my presence here is causing you a problem. I think the best thing I can do is leave. I'll go up and get my stuff. Jane had a pained look on her face as I left the room. Derek and Linda were still arguing. When I came down with my bag, I popped in to say my goodbyes, just in time to hear Jane. I'm sorry, Mom, but if Kevin isn't welcome here, then neither am I. Wait there, Kevin. I'm coming with you. Derek came out and apologized for his wife. I told him where we'd be and to give us a call if he managed to talk her round. I saw Jane at the top of the stairs and dashed up to bring down her case. She followed me down and, as I went out with the bags, she gave her dad a kiss. Back at the hotel we did try out that bed. We had some of the best sex we'd ever had. The next day I called Derek and invited them both to come to dinner with us at the hotel. He turned up without Linda, and that set the pattern for the rest of our relationship. Derek was a good bloke who was willing to give me the benefit of the doubt, but his wife was convinced that I was some evil beast. We never went back to stay in Doncaster, but I did fix things up for Jane to see her dad. They obviously had a very special relationship, while he and I became great friends. When I suggested that she accompany me on my annual skiing holiday, he actively encouraged her to go. Two weeks in Closters staying in a client's ski lodge was heavenly. Jane was keen to learn to ski and took to it like a duck to water. There was no shortage of ski instructors keen to help her develop her technique. She simply told them that she already had a personal instructor. By the end of the first week, she progressed from the nursery slopes to some of the more exciting runs. I offered nights out in Davos, where the Apre ski scene was much more active, but she was happy to stay in quieter clusters and curl up in front of the fire with me. While we were there we had a press invasion. 
Charlie and the young princes had apparently joined us. Jane couldn't understand why I found it so funny, but I was thinking of Lisa and her wanting to mix with the jet set, yet here I was holidaying with royalty. While Bob and Wendy were away on their cruise, it fell to me to handle the entertaining of clients and, of course, Jane always came with me and played hostess. I was conscious that there was some talk about my young partner. The talk didn't worry me, and the clients were always charmed by her. It wasn't just her youthful good looks. She really did charm them. It seemed effortless to her. She had some understanding of business. After all, she was studying business and corporate law. She was keen to learn what she could, and the way she listened so intently to the points put forward endeared her to the clients we entertained. When Bob returned, he seemed to be very happy with the way things had gone. He invited Jane and I to dinner so that he could outline his plans for himself and the company. He was impressed with Jane and couldn't resist asking me about her. I must say, young Jane is quite something. How did you meet her? On a scouting trip at the university. It was the first time I lied to Bob. I hoped he'd forgive me if he found out the truth. She acts like a mature young lady for her age. How old is she? 20. And you're what? 42? The age gap doesn't throw up any problems? No, Bob, not really. There was no age gap with Lisa, but I seemed to have more in common with Jane than I ended up having with Lisa. Well, you seem happy enough, and you're certainly looking well. I am, Bob. I know it may not last, but I'm happy now, and I'm willing to take it while I can. As dinner progressed, Bob got around to his plans which were actually a lot more far-reaching than I'd expected. Our production side doesn't make a whole lot of money. It's your division, design and development, that makes the cash, as you well know. The last item you developed is making us more in a week than production makes in a year. So what are you saying, Bob? Do you want to close the production side? Oh no, we still make money on it. But I'm saying that expansion of manufacturing doesn't make a lot of sense. Investing in design and development does. What would you say is the biggest growth area? Digital signal processing, without a doubt. And you've been working on designing chips for that purpose. Yes, we're very close to a marketable floor plan. What I want is for you to expand that division and especially in the development of DSP chips. I want you to run that side of the business and I'll concentrate on manufacturing. I'm going to cut my time down to three days a week. Of course, it will mean an increase in salary. As we made our way back home in the back of a taxi, Jane cuddled up to me, her head on my shoulder and both her hands holding onto my arm. Did I hear things right back there? Was my man just asked to take over the running of most of the business? Her words took me a bit by surprise. If by your man you mean me, then yes, I have. Oh, that's so cool. You must be really good at what you do if he trusts you enough to put you in charge. I'm good at some things. There are some things I'm really good at. And I took her in my arms and kissed her. As we broke the kiss, she smiled at me. There are some things that go without saying. Sex was always outstanding on nights we'd been entertaining. I wasn't sure whether it was seeing me in action with the clients or dancing with the clients who were sometimes younger than me. However, this night she made it perfectly clear. After the most amazing BJ, she straddled me and I enjoyed this cowgirl. She looked down at me with a look in her eyes I didn't recognize. I am so proud of you. I felt my chest puff up and I swear my Johnny grew another inch. The police compensated me in full for all the damage to my property and for my accommodation while the house was being repaired. They also paid for damage to my reputation. The post was the one I relished the most. Half a million pounds and a grudging apology. Of course, they never accepted that I was innocent, just that, so far, no evidence had been found. The money was tainted as far as I was concerned. Having won it, I had no idea what to do with it. It was Jane who came up with the best solution. The Kevin Bryant bursary for promising engineering students. Now that she was living with me, there was no need to pay for her accommodation, and since the object of our arrangement was to avoid her being burdened with debt, I started paying her tuition fees. At first, she objected but I made it clear the matter wasn't up for discussion. What she didn't realize was that, for me, paying the bills was a constant reminder of our arrangement. A reminder I needed if I was going to be able to deal with the aftermath when it came to an end. By the spring of that year, I was feeling the best I ever had. Thanks to my exercise regime, I'd lost a bit of weight and developed a physique younger men would be envious of. My face, too, was thinner. The change was enough to make Sally, my PA, pass comment, I'll say one thing for that young lady of yours, she's certainly good for you. What do you mean by that? I asked. Look at you. You look 10 years younger. If that's the effect of having a younger partner, then I'm getting myself a toy boy. I think the exercise and eating will had something to do with it. However, you're right about one thing. Jane was the inspiration. Well, whatever she's doing, she should keep on doing it. You know, 
A lot of people were worried about you the last couple of years. Don't worry, Sally. She's probably going home for the holidays. So I'll be back to my old Moro self. If the girl's got any sense, she won't leave you on your own for long. That night over dinner, I asked Jane about her plans for the holidays. Well, I was going to talk to you about that. Danvers hires students for holiday work, don't they? Yeah, we do, but they're normally engineering students for my department. Are you telling me you're looking for a holiday job here? I thought you'd be going home. Well, I don't think I could take more than a week with my mother, especially after Christmas. So, if it's all the same to you, I'd like to hang out here. That's why I wanted a job. Okay. I'll talk to the office manager tomorrow to see if there are any vacancies for temporary work. I was struck by the difference between Jane and Elliot. Both of them had no need to work through the holidays, but whereas Elliot took every opportunity to avoid working, Jane was keen to get whatever experience she could. The following morning I ran the idea past Bob Danvers. To my surprise Bob was really keen on the idea. We depend almost as much on the office staff as we do on the engineers. It's about time we started training them. Do you have someone in mind, Kevin? Well, Jane asked me if we took on business trainees, and it seemed like a good idea. I think she has it in mind to apply. Apply nothing, Kevin. See Mrs. Pritchard, the office manager, and tell her to draw up a training scheme for young Jane. That summer was absolute bliss. We saw each other during the day as well as at home. I bought a couple of bicycles, and we would ride out to the country parks and take a picnic. I made a point of riding behind her so I could gaze upon her divine hips. Right through to October we enjoyed each and every day. So when term started it was a bit of a wrench letting her return to university. By that July, Danvers launched our first DSP chip, and it was an immediate success. With no facilities for chip production, we farmed it out to specialist companies. However, once the telecoms companies found out what it could do they were beating a path to our door with requests for further integration plans. With Danvers being paid to integrate our own design into customers' current technology and being paid a small percentage of the price of every chip produced using our design, we gained a large increase in income with virtually no increase in costs. We had become part of the knowledge economy, selling our know-how. We employed a few more graduates and started work on our next project. With my personal life on a roll and the company doing so well, the only cloud on my horizon was Elliot. He seemed to believe I had something to do with his mother's disappearance. He barely spoke to me other than to give me grief. Sometimes I started to believe that he thought I'd murdered her. I knew he was serious about a girl he was seeing, and the rumor was he was planning to marry her. However, I never even got to meet her, and I had my doubts about getting an invitation to the wedding. I was brought out of my thoughts by a loud voice. Do you have any idea of the damage you did, Mum? Elliot was beginning to lose his temper with Lisa. I know about the police investigation, but none of that was my fault. Of course it was your fault. Without so much as a buy your leave, you just disappear. You can't blame the police, and me, come to that, for being suspicious. How could you do that without even contacting me to say you were alright? What are you talking about? You didn't need me. You'd moved out and gone to London. Your father didn't need me. We hadn't had a proper relationship for years. That's why he never tried to find me. Of course I needed you. I only went into the financial sector because of you. I wanted you to be proud of me. I wanted to be able to talk to you to show you how well I'd done. But you weren't here. You had your father. You could have talked to him. No, I couldn't. You destroyed that, as well. I couldn't believe you'd just leave, and I'm sorry to say I blamed him for that. I even wondered whether the police might be right. I've hardly spoken to Dad since you left. Oh, darling. You can't really have believed your father killed me. Lisa started to cry. I didn't know what to believe, and I had no one to help make sense of it all. I even tried to stop him divorcing you. Stop saying that. How could he divorce me without my knowing about it? The divorce came at a most inconvenient time for me, coming as it did around the same time as Jane's graduation. It seemed like the end of two relationships were coming together. Thankfully my lawyer, Guy Pearson, was more than capable of tying up one loose end for me. The relationship with Jane was another matter. With her graduation came the end of our arrangement. I had tried to prepare myself for the day, but I hadn't been able to stop myself. I was totally in love with the girl. The age difference meant nothing to me. I only knew my life had never been better, and now part of that was coming to an end. Jane had noticed how preoccupied I'd become, but I just told her it was due to the divorce. I tried very hard to encourage her when it came to finding a job. I was keen for her to get a position that would benefit her most. Matters came to a head when she was offered what many would say was a plum job. She came to me with the letter in her hand. Kevin, I've been offered a job by KPMG in their accountancy division. I tried unsuccessfully to read the expression on her face. 
That's great news. A couple of years on their graduate training scheme, and you'll be able to go where you like. You'll be in demand. But it's in London. Well, it may not be my cup of tea, but you're a young girl. You'll enjoy the fast pace and the nightlife. So, you want me to take it? I want you to do whatever's best for you. Oh, for God's sake, Kevin, why can't you just tell me what you think? Do you want me to go to London? I have no say in the matter. Our arrangement's coming to an end. Now you should start doing what's best for you. Our arrangement? Is that all I mean to you? Perhaps I should go to London. She started to sob uncontrollably. I put my arm around her, and we sat together on the sofa. Of course, you mean more to me than that, but I thought you'd want to get out in the world, find a man your own age, and live life to the full. Isn't that what you want? The tears welled up in my eyes. Kevin Bryant, for such a clever man you can be really stupid at times. I don't want a man my own age. Yes, I want to get out in the world, but I want to do that with you. I don't want to leave you, but if you want me to go to London I will. You mean you'd give up this chance, to stay here with this old man? You're 45, that's not old, and in case you hadn't noticed I'm in love with you. I want to move my stuff out of that spare room. Now are you going to take me to bed and show me how much you love me? I got up, picked her up and carried her up to the bedroom. We lay on the bed, just holding each other, undressing each other and running our hands over each other. After another hot session, I asked, Well, did you enjoy it? Oh yes, it was unbelievable. How about you? It felt amazing, but I don't think I want to do it all the time. I miss the holding and hugging. I like to look at you and feel you while we're making love. She reached back to me. How do you always know the nicest things to say? She eased herself off the bed and turned around to look at me. She put one knee on the bed and leaned forward to kiss me. I forgot to tell you. I've had another job offer. The place where I've been working in the holidays have made me an offer. The money's not so good, but I really like some of the staff there. Bob Danvers has offered you a job? He didn't tell me. Well, he has and I think I might take it. The guy who runs the design and development side is a real hunk. I could really go for him. You're really going to work at Danvers? And you really want to stay with me? I've wanted to stay with you since our first Christmas, you wonderful man. I can't wait for you to be my boss. You could punish me on the desk if I did anything wrong, she giggled. I couldn't believe all my fears had been groundless, and the wonderful girl I loved so much was deeply in love with me. For the first time, there was a need for some urgency in the matter of my divorce. I'd put a lot of faith in Guy being able to pull it off for me, and was somewhat surprised when he told me I'd have to go to court to explain the efforts we'd made to find Lisa. Guy told me we'd have no problems if I was to set aside half of my current worth for Lisa to claim when she eventually turned up. No way, Guy. She abandoned me and left her bank cards. If that isn't saying she doesn't want anything from me, what does? It's been three years now. Sorry, Kevin. But if that's what you want, you're going to have to go before the judge. So it was that I ended up in county court, explaining what we'd done to find Lisa. It would seem three years of advertising wasn't enough. We made an arrangement for one further year, in which I would have to advertise in other countries. The court accepted that if Lisa had left the country she'd most likely be in Europe, so it was the European press I had to concentrate on. I was already pretty unhappy, but when I met Detective Inspector Maynard on the way out of court the day just got worse. Good morning, Mr. Bryant, and thank you. You've finally given me something. What the hell are you talking about, Inspector? What have I given you? Motive, Mr. Bryant. Half your net worth must amount to a couple of hundred thousand pounds. People have been murdered for a lot less. Inspector, there is only one reason why I'd like my wife to return. To see the look on your face while you apologize for harassing me. The file is still open, Mr. Bryant, and I'm a patient man. You will wait a long time for any evidence of my wife's murder, because she isn't dead. I walked off and left him to his own devices. It took the whole of the next year, advertising in Britain and the rest of Europe, asking for Lisa to come forward and deal with the divorce. We got no response, but we did receive a few letters from people who claimed they'd seen her. I passed those on to Inspector Maynard, but he seemed very uninterested. Nevertheless, at the end of the year the court awarded me a decree nisi which would become absolute in six weeks. I was free for the first time in 24 years. For a short period I wondered about getting married to Jane, but she didn't seem too bothered about it, and we were happy enough as we were. Hell, we weren't just happy enough. I was the happiest I'd ever been. If it weren't for my worsening relationship with Elliot, life would have been perfect. He'd recently got married, and if it hadn't been for his wife, Christine, I wouldn't have been invited to the wedding. I liked Christine. She seemed like a level-headed girl, and she tried hard to repair our relationship. She was to find it an uphill struggle. Really, mother? 
You surely didn't expect to come back and find nothing had changed. You deserted us without so much as a goodbye. We've moved on, Mom. Dad's moved on, and to do that he had to divorce you. But surely I have some say in it. I was one of the partners in the marriage. You surely can't dissolve it without me having any say. You had your say the day you walked out that door. I had no need to say anything. Elliot was doing a sterling job of putting his mother in her place. For the first time since Lisa left, he was actually defending me. So, what happened, Kevin? How did you manage to divorce me? Elliot was spot on. You effectively did the job for me by walking out. It was only the division of assets that held things up. The court insisted that I gave you every chance to come forward to claim your share of our combined wealth. And did you? I certainly did. I placed adverts in La Monde, Lou Figaro, El Pius, La Republica, and all the British press. When you didn't come forward, the court took the view that you weren't bothered. So, if we're divorced, what's happened to my share of our life together? That's exactly what the court wanted you to come back and claim. When you failed to come forward, they looked at the fact that you'd left all your bank cards and came to the conclusion that you'd abandoned all of our assets and had no further interest in them. So, you see, my dear, there is no your share. I put 21 years into our marriage, and now you say I'm left with nothing? You trapped me in this marriage, and you gave it little more than 11 years before deciding the grass was greener elsewhere. Ever since Elliot went to that bloody school and you started to get involved you became dissatisfied with me, and when I wasn't prepared to act like the people you admired you made it clear who you'd side with. You had your share out of this marriage. In clothes alone you had your share. There are still thousands of pounds worth of clothes and shoes upstairs. You're welcome to take them whenever you want. Lisa sat down sobbing. Tears ran down her cheeks as she sat there rocking back and forth on the chair. I just sat and looked at her occasionally, exchanging glances with my son. Eventually the crying stopped, and we were able to talk again. Just why did you come back, Lisa? I admit it, I was in trouble. You were right about those people, Kevin. Most of them just use people for what they can get from them. I left with Henry, who only wanted me to get at you. Once the police and the press lost interest in you, he had no further use for me. I made friends with an older man who took me off to Barbados. After a couple of years, he traded me in for a younger model. I hitched a ride with a group of lads bringing a yacht back to Spain. I ended up in Malaga where I met a nice English man. I thought he was a bit of a rough diamond, but he treated me well, and he seemed to be loaded. Well, he turned out to be a criminal, and you know the rest from what the police said. I thought I was in serious trouble, so I loaded up the car and made for the only place I knew I'd be safe. I came back to the only man I've ever loved. And you expected me to welcome you with open arms? No, of course not. I knew you'd be angry. You had every right. But I thought if I tried really hard, I might be able to salvage what was left of our marriage. We loved each other once. I hoped I could make you love me again. But now I find there's nothing left to salvage. Well, you got most of that right. Yes, I am angry. Yes, there's nothing left to salvage. And yes, we loved each other once. Or at least I loved you. Even though you trapped me in an early marriage, I still loved you. I would have married you anyway. You didn't need to get pregnant. I loved you right up to the point where you took the side of that parasite, Henry, against me. That was when I realized, I was just a meal ticket to you. From then on I didn't care what you did. Oh, Kevin, you were never just a meal ticket to me. I've loved you since we were at school. Yes, I deliberately got pregnant. I was frightened I'd lose you once you were qualified and found a job. Yes, I wanted you to make better use of your abilities. I looked at people like Henry and thought, my Kevin is twice as smart as you, but still Henry earned far more than you. By insisting on sticking to your principles and working for that tin pot electronics company, you turned your back on making real money. And when I tried to make you see it, you turned your back on me. I tried to make you take notice of me, but you didn't seem interested. I started dating other men, and we'd go places where people who knew you would go. I knew they'd tell you. I thought you'd challenge me. We might fight, but at least you'd talk to me. So everything was my fault. Even when you were playing around and a lesser man would have thrown you out. It was all my fault. No, Kevin, I was wrong. I thought success was all about money, but it isn't. Is it? Look at you. Still living in the same house, working at the same place, and you're happy. I could have been happy, too. If only I hadn't got so wound up about you being a millionaire like we used to dream about. Elliot just sat looking at Lisa. He shook his head, laughing. You really don't know, do you? He said to Lisa. Of course she didn't know, and why should she? No one would have expected it. I certainly didn't. I couldn't even believe it when Bob Danvers walked into my office and laid the paperwork on my desk. It took me a couple of times reading it all through before it really sank in. A large company, 
very big in the telecoms business, had made a bid for the company. The company Bob owned lock, stock, and barrel, and they were offering way over the odds for it. After my second read through, I had two questions. Well, it's very interesting, Bob, and a hell of a good price. What I want to know is, are you going to take it, and what has it got to do with me? Okay, Kevin, cards on the table. I'll answer your second question first. The deal has everything to do with you. For the deal to go through, you have to sign a binding five-year contract. These boys have done their homework. They know who has generated all the income for this company, and they don't want it if that man doesn't sign up to the deal. They're offering a hell of a salary, far more than I pay you. With bonuses, you'd have a banker's income. So, what about the first question? Are you going to sell? You know my position. I've been taking a back seat for the last few years. Wendy and I want to enjoy our retirement together. This deal provides one hell of a retirement package. I sense a but coming up, Bob. But what? You know me too well. There is a but. It doesn't affect you. But it's there nonetheless. You've changed this company, Kevin, almost beyond recognition. But there is still the bit there that I found it. The production side. Yes, we designed then, too. But we only designed things we'd make. Now we design things our workshop never sees. And it makes us plenty of money. But those blokes out on the shop floor rely on us making things. This other company doesn't want that. It doesn't fit what they do. They only really want your side of the business. They'll take production because it comes as a package, but they don't want it. In a year or two, they'll either close it down or sell it off. I've known some of those blokes for most of their working life. I can't do that to them. So, you don't sell, and I don't get a banker's salary. I can live with that. But I don't want to go on forever, Kevin. I want to retire. No, what I need is an alternative buyer. Someone who loves this company as much as I do. Someone who will look after the workforce, and someone they all look up to. That's when the penny dropped. Now hold on, Bob. I don't have that kind of money, and I doubt very much I could raise it. Bob picked up the bid documents and waved them at me. These people are offering way over the odds. We both know it, and we both know why. If I can guarantee the production side keeps going, then I'm willing to sell for a market valuation, and I don't have to sell the whole company. I could keep 15%. The income could top up my pension. So, I'm going to raise 85% of what this company is worth. I'm sorry, Bob. I just don't see it. Bob started to get quite excited, and he was much more emphatic. Yes, you can, son. I've already spoken to the bank. We use one of those tricks the financial wizards use when they screw people. Your house must be worth 400000 and I'll bet you could lay your hands on another 100000 You put that up as surety, and the bank loans you the money to buy the business. Once you can show you own 85% of the company, you can transfer the debt to the company. The bank pays me. The company pays the bank back over a period of time. You don't even end up with a mortgage. You talk it over with Jane tonight. She'll tell you it's all legitimate. The bank is sending someone over tomorrow at 2 to talk to us about it. Bob had said I knew him too well, but he certainly reciprocated. He knew I couldn't turn it down. He knew all the right buttons to press, and he'd press them. As he left, he called out to my PA, Sally, I think the future owner of the company could do with a coffee. When Sally came in with the coffee five minutes later, I was still pacing up and down in the office, unable to take it all in. She put the coffee down. Is it true, Kevin? Are you buying the company? It certainly looks like it, Sally. Oh, I'm so pleased, she said and planted a big kiss on my lips. I can't wait to tell everyone. They've all been worrying about what happens if Bob retires. Now I can tell them everything will be all right. For the moment, Sally, you can't tell them anything. Wait until the deal is confirmed, and then we can tell them. Jane and I talked the matter through over dinner, and she confirmed that everything Bob had said was true. I still didn't understand it. To me it seemed like free money. So Jane explained. Basically, when you transfer the debt to the company, the value of the company you own will fall accordingly. The profit the company makes will fall because of servicing the debt, but with profits rising the way there you won't notice that. As the debt is paid off the value of the company you own will rise. It's not actually free money, but it does mean if the company goes belly up, which we know it won't, you're protected. So that was the way it happened. In the course of that year I got divorced and became the owner of the company I'd worked for. Bob took Wendy on another world cruise to celebrate. Sally was right. When we announced the deal over the public address system, it was greeted by cheers from the shop floor. And when I left, I had a large number of the employees wanting to shake my hand. So, what is it I don't know? Asked Lisa. What is it that's so bloody funny? You are, mum, going on about dad not being a millionaire. All it took was for you to leave. Elliot, there's no call for that. I told him. Well, it's true, dad. If she was so hung up on you being a millionaire, she should have stuck around. Are you trying to tell me your father? 
who still works for that tin pot electronics company, is a wealthy man? Quite frankly, Elliot, I find that difficult to believe. Firstly, that tin pot electronics company is one of the leaders of what's called the knowledge economy, selling their know how all over the world. There's ARM, selling processor know how, and there's Danvers, doing the same in DSP, and DSP is what the telecoms world want right now. Secondly, he doesn't work for Danvers Electronics, he owns it. He's a millionaire, on paper at least. Lisa was visibly shocked. She just sat there with her mouth open. Eventually it started to sink in, and she looked at me. But you still live in this house. Why, when you could afford something much better? The house suits me fine. I don't need anything bigger or better. Don't tell me you're still driving that old Skoda. No, that had to go. I drive a Jag these days. Elliot told me he had to go and, for the first time in more than six years, he gave me a hug. I know it doesn't begin to cover it, Dad, but I am sorry. If the invitation is still open, I'll see you tomorrow. I think Christine was planning to come anyway. I know she's bought a dress. Of course it's still open, but you've blown your chances of being best man. We both laughed and I walked him to the door. As he was leaving, he checked I'd be okay with Lisa. I assured him there was nothing to worry about. I went back into the house to find Lisa making a tour of inspection. She picked up a photo of me with Jane. Who's the girl then, Kevin? That's Jane, Jane Draper. Hmm. I don't think I know any Drapers. No, I don't think you know her. From this picture, anyone would think she was your girlfriend. No, she's not my girlfriend. She's my fiancé. Your fiancé? Kevin, have you gone mad? She looks young enough to be your daughter. After divorcing Lisa, I was in no hurry to tie myself to another woman. Jane never mentioned marriage, and seemed to be content to carry on the way we were. To all intents and purposes we were like a married couple anyway, so without any children there didn't seem to be any need to change things. Our life together was as blissful as I could remember, and unlike when I first started out with Lisa, we had no money problems. However, I was taken somewhat by surprise one night when Jane came to me, and after a short cuddle made her feelings known. Kevin, would you like us to have a baby? I hadn't really given it any thought. Don't you think I'm getting rather old for that? No, I don't. You're very young for your age, and I would really like to have a family. I started to get out of the bed. Well, I don't want to bring any little fatherless babies into this world. As I walked around the bed I saw her face drop and tears started to form in her eyes. I stood alongside her and dropped down onto one knee. Jane, will you marry me? She looked at me with a puzzled expression, then, as she put the statement together with the proposal, a smile slowly spread across her face. You mean we can start a family? Only once we're married. So I ask again, will you marry me? Oh yes, yes, you know I will. She threw her arms around my neck and pulled me back into bed. I didn't get a lot of sleep that night, and the following day we took a trip to the jewelers. Jane tried to get her mother on board with planning the wedding, but despite their grudging apology she remained convinced the post had got it right and her daughter was marrying a murderer. Her father was overjoyed and offered whatever help he could. Jane put off setting a date for a few weeks, and I was a bit puzzled as to why. All was revealed when she produced a document on which I had to list all of my assets. She was drawing up a prenuptial agreement. That evening I challenged her. What on earth are you doing drawing up a prenuptial? What have you got to protect from me? Nothing, Kevin. But you have, and I know what people will say. People like Elliot, for instance. They'll say I'm a gold digger, just after your money. The only thing I want from this marriage is you. That's why I want this agreement. I don't expect us to break up, but if one day you get tired of me, I don't want to walk away with anything I didn't contribute. Well, I'm not having it, Jane. I love you. What's mine is yours, and that's the way I want it. I love you too, that's why I want this. I want people to know that I'm marrying you because I love you, not because I want to get my hands on your money. I don't care what other people think. I want to marry you. And when I say with all my worldly goods I thee endow, I want to mean it. Anyway, prenuptials are not legally enforceable in this country. I know that, Kevin, but the court will take account of what we each brought to the marriage. I really don't want to argue about it, but if we don't do this I can't marry you. Reluctantly I gave way. After all, none of it would make a difference unless we divorced and I never expected that to happen. No sooner had I signed the agreement and listed my assets than Jane had set the date. Elliot reacted in the way Jane had predicted. Even with the agreement he still insisted Jane was after his inheritance. When I asked him to be my best man he laughed, and told me he wasn't even sure if he'd come to the wedding. Bob Danvers jumped at the chance. He knew Jane and was delighted that we'd decided to tie the knot. The last thing I expected was the return of my ex-wife. Jane is 24, we're deeply in love, and I'm marrying her tomorrow. 
So, it's true. There's no fool like an old fool. Just what do you mean by that? What do you think? You become a very wealthy man and, surprise, surprise, a pretty young woman wants to marry you. You're not stupid, Kevin. Surely you see she's just after what she can get. We've been together for a little over five years, Lisa. If she was just a gold digger, as you seem to think, she's had plenty of time to trap me by getting pregnant. I watched Lisa's face and could see the comment about pregnancy had hit its target. You'll doubtless be pleased to know we have a prenuptial agreement, at Jane's insistence, which will exclude my current assets from any divorce settlement. You think she's going to marry me, stay a few years, then leave with a big divorce settlement. If she does leave, she'd be no better off than she was when I met her, and that was all her idea. So, you're getting married and I have nothing to show for 21 years of being married to you. I'm supposed to accept it while you shower everything on some young bimbo. It's not going to happen, Kevin. I'll contest the divorce settlement. I'm tempted to say go ahead, and much good may it do you, but you're not going to do that, are you? You aren't going to contest anything, because you want my help. I've known you long enough, Lisa. You wouldn't come back here prepared to eat humble pie and try to salvage what's left of our marriage, if you had any alternative. None of your posh friends want to know you, and you dumped the others when you walked out on me. The only experience you have is of being a wife and stay-at-home mom, other than what you got up to in the last six years. My guess is you have a bit of cash, but nowhere to go and no one to turn to. In short, you are an old hooker who never saved a dime in her life and has tunnels big enough for trains. You are as useful as tits on a pig. Lisa sat with her head in her hands, sobbing. Yes, yes, you're right, she said between sobs. I've been a bloody fool and now you hate me for it. I really am sorry, Kevin. Okay, you can stop all that. I don't hate you and never have, and I never said I wouldn't help you. However, I will expect something in return for my help. After I outlined what I wanted her to do I said about making the necessary phone calls. First it was to book Lisa into a hotel, then it was to speak to Derek Draper. Derek, how are you? Are they treating you well? Couldn't be better, son. What can I do for you? You're not planning a last-minute stag night, are you? No, nothing like that, Derek. Tell me, is Linda with you? Oh, yes, she's here, son. But I hope you're not expecting her at the wedding. She's not noted for her open mind. I'm sad to say. She plans to go shopping instead. Well, Derek, I just may have something that will change her mind. I know a mother wouldn't dream of turning up to her daughter's wedding in anything other than a new outfit. Now, if I give you details of the shops where I have an account, do you think you can get Linda to buy a new outfit so she can come to the wedding? I can get her to the shops if you can give me something that will get her to the wedding. I outlined what I expected to happen, and he agreed to do his best. Over the years I'd collected a number of business cards from the gentlemen of the press. I thought this was the time to use them. To each of them I gave the same message. Kevin Bryant is getting married tomorrow in the Great Hall of Audley Manor. If you attend the reception for the speeches you may learn something that will interest you. As long as you leave when asked, you will find that you are welcome. I think I managed to contact all the national newspapers and a few of the regional ones. There was, of course, one exception. I didn't inform the post. I must admit that I had a bit of a disturbed night. The feeling of apprehension kept waking me. I was really excited by the time Bob Danvers turned up in the morning. Come on, Kevin. I'm taking you out to breakfast. We went off to a local hotel and enjoyed a very good breakfast. Over breakfast, we discussed the plan for the day and worked out our own schedule. Bob asked if I had any worries about the day. I don't think so, Bob. The only things I have to worry about are Jane changing her mind and Lisa. You have no worries about Jane. The girl adores you. Anyone can see that. Why you should worry about Lisa, I don't know. She walked out on you, man. You shouldn't be worrying about her. She's back, Bob. Turned up yesterday. It was unbelievable. Just breezed into the house, bold as brass, as if she just got back from the shops. Does she know what's happening today? She does now. I have to say, she didn't like it much. She didn't like the fact that we're divorced and that she didn't get anything out of it. I think I've worked out a deal with her. I have a plan and as long as she sticks to it, everything should be okay. I'm worried about spoiling Jane's big day. I outlined my plan to Bob, and he agreed to go along with my little scheme and to handle Lisa while I was on honeymoon. We finished our breakfast and made our way home. I asked Bob if he would get all the locks changed on my house while I was away. We got ourselves ready and set off for Audley Manor. Everything was going according to plan. However, the gentlemen of the press started turning up long before the guests. Bob Danvers had a few words with them basically telling them to keep out of sight until the speeches at the reception. The guests started to arrive, and Bob and I took up our positions. As the seats started to fill I heard someone calling out, 
trying to get my attention. I turned to see Linda Draper waving at me. Her smile was beaming from ear to ear. She moved her hands down either side of her body indicating that I should look at what she was wearing. I put my thumb up and told her she looked lovely. It seemed like no time at all till the band struck up, playing the wedding march. I turned to watch her walk down the aisle on the arm of her father. She stopped momentarily when she saw her mother standing in the front row, then made her way to stand at my side. How did you get my mother here? She asked. Tell you later, I whispered. The vicar called the congregation to order and the service started. I did have a few butterflies when we got to the speak now or forever hold your peace part. I wondered whether Lisa might try to throw a spanner in the works. I needn't have worried. The service went off without a hitch, and when she lifted her veil it took all of my self-restraint to stop it just kissing her. When we filed out for the photographs, she gave my arm a squeeze. All right, smarters, give it up. How did you get mum here, and when did she get that outfit? I know I've never seen it before. There were some unexpected developments yesterday, and I've had to make a few small changes to the plan. I'm afraid it may take some of the attention away from our special day. I don't care. I've got you and my mom and dad were here to see it happen. When the photos were all taken, we went back into the hall for the reception. After the meal, Derek stood up and made a speech telling people about his daughter and welcoming me to his family. Bob Danvers gave a typical best man speech and gave everyone a good laugh at my expense, then it was my turn. I started out telling people the same tale I told Bob about how we met and how much I loved my new bride. Then came the crunch. I know Bob has already thanked you all for coming and mentioned those of you who have traveled a long way to get here. However, there is one person Bob hasn't mentioned, who has come a very long way to be here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big welcome to Lisa, my ex-wife. It has taken a lot for her to get here today, and I'd like to welcome her. Come on, Lisa, stand up and let everyone see you. Lisa stood up, and the press men gathered round her, shouting questions and taking photographs. I let this carry on for a minute or so. Gentlemen, please remember this is Jane's and my wedding. So I ask you now to leave us to continue our celebrations. Mr. Danvers will ensure that you all have her contact details. I looked around the hall. The number of shocked faces was amazing. Slowly things returned to normal, and we got the party started. By the time Jane and I left for the hotel things were in full swing. We left them all to it. We had better things to do. We were spending the night in a hotel in Gatwick before flying out to St. Lucia the following morning. It certainly wasn't the first time we'd shared a hotel room, but this time it was special. I was no longer playing the part of the sugar daddy looking after a girl young enough to be my daughter in return for her sexual favors. To be honest, I hadn't felt that way for a number of years. This night was different. On this night, I was welcoming my lovely new wife to my bed and hopefully into the rest of my life. Like a good husband, I was ready for bed first and I sat there waiting for her to make her entrance. I had no idea what to expect. What I got just blew me away. She walked from the bathroom slowly and deliberately placing each foot directly in front of the other in that catwalk style that makes the hips sway. Her slender body was clothed in a white lace basque. Each leg was covered in a white stocking, and she wore her white-heeled wedding shoes. Her long hair fell down over her shoulders, and her full lips showed just a trace of lipstick. She held her hands slightly out from her body and carried a small packet in her left hand. She came to one side of the bed and knelt on it with one knee, while she lifted my chin with her right hand. She bent, kissed me tenderly on the lips, and then showed me the packet of contraceptive pills she had in her left hand. Getting up off the bed she turned and, with the same walk, went back to the bin and dropped the packet into it. She returned to the bed, kicked off her shoes and pulled back the covers. As she climbed onto the bed she kissed me again and spoke for the first time. Okay, Mr. Bryant, let's make babies. Sure, Mrs. Bryant. What did you just call me? Mrs. Bryant. Say it again. I've got to get used to that. Okay. Mrs. Bryant. Following our sexual athletics I did manage to give Jane the baby we wanted, and I enjoyed being a dad again. In fact, I enjoyed it so much we did it again. Both children are in for a confusing time, as Elliot also has two children now. I have two children and two grandchildren, all more or less the same age. Christine has been very good for Elliot, who has taken a cut in salary to come and work for me. Our relationship has never been better. Being in close proximity of the people whose lives are affected by his decisions has done him the world of good. I'm becoming very proud of him, and he seems to be a happier man. His relationship with his mother has, I'm afraid, taken a serious knock. It's only Christine's insistence that the children need a grandma that keeps them in contact. Lisa sold her story to the Sunday papers and came away with a little over a hundred thousand pounds. I was pleasantly surprised that it painted me in a very good light. 
When it came to her foreign adventures, she told it like it was and named names. It stirred up a shitstorm but not for me. Of course, a hundred grand didn't last Lisa very long. Just long enough, in fact, for her to find herself a wealthy old man who actually married her. Jane's mother hasn't bought a copy of the post since the day of the wedding. She's now immensely proud of her daughter and son-in-law. She and Derek have moved down from Doncaster to be nearer their grandchildren. Derek and I still get on very well. Me, I'm happy as a pig in muck, and why wouldn't I be? I have a lovely young wife who loves me and three children, one of whom is looking after his father's interests and two who think daddy is some kind of superhero. It's been an eventful life so far, and long may it continue. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.